my name is Bruce Fleming, so you can all say, good morning, Mr. Fleming. <laughs> Before we start, I'd just like to uh, acknowledge our traditional owners and a welcome to country. This conference has been held on the traditional lands of the Wurundjeri people in the Kulin Nation, and I wish to acknowledge them as the traditional owners. I also pay my respects to their elders, past and present, and the elders from other communities who may be present here today. Thank you. So welcome to the 2017 Ozendock Connections Conference. As I said, my name is Bruce Fleming and I am honoured and privileged to be uh, MC, moderator, and uh, doing a facilitation session this afternoon on what it means to be inspired. Um, I've been inspired to uh, be here for the next two days. Um, I like to operate through values of love, joy and connection, and that really is uh, this conference about connections. So for those of you who do survive the two-day conference, I will be giving you some home play, but it is all about connection with the people in the room, with your loved ones, in the broader community, and it's all about making the condition, uh, recognising it, providing opportunities, and really helping each other, and making OSDOC better and more relevant to our community, to support those who most need it. So, Christina Coburn, our President of OSDOC, I'd like to introduce her first, and just to quickly go through our esteemed panel members, we have the Honourable Member from, uh, Federal Member from Jelly Grant, Tim Watts. We also have Professor Liddy, Linda Richards, <coughs> Professor Warren Brown, Dr Lynn Paul, and Professor Elliot Shear. We'll be speaking throughout the, uh, the day, but without further ado, I'd like you to uh, give a big warm welcome to the President, Christina Coburn. Okay, I've got something written down, so I'll probably just be reading it because, um, just because, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> if I don't faint. So, <laughs> welcome to our 2017 Connections Conference. It's been a mammoth pr production putting it, this all together and I'm glad you could join us. Over the next few days, I'm sure we'll share our stories, laugh together and even cry together. As most of you know, I'm the President. I go by, by a few names for my many personalities. Some know me as Christina, some as Tina and some Ausdoc Screening. To the most important people, I'm known as Mum. I have three boys, Connor, Hamish and Kyle. Connor and Kyle both have ACC. They also share the same birthday, which still amazes me. Hamish, my middle son, is fine. Since the last conference, our, group has, our Facebook group has doubled in size. We have established an International Awareness Day, added a few more professionals to our advisors list. We've opened an online shop and we've welcomed our little mascot, Edna, and I was going to hold her up, but I haven't got her here. But she's the little rat-looking thing. fat tailed Dunna <laughs> is what she is. Because all my supers are missing their covers close. So we have an amazing, hard-working team that I'm very, very proud of. Um, I'd like to give special thanks to our secretary, Marie. She's standing over there um, for putting this awesome program together. Okay, so here we have access to some of the best professionals in their fields. I want to encourage you all to ask as many questions as you like. And remember that there's no stupid question. Because if anyone's going to ask a stupid question, it's going to be me. So you'll be safe. I'll be the stupidest one. So we have over 100 guests here for you to get to know. And lived experience is the most powerful. So I want to encourage you to share your stories. So let's make this conference a memorable one. Thank you, guys. I'd like to call up uh, the Honourable Member for Jellybrand, Tim Watts. Thank you. Um, and I'd also like to begin today by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we meet and pay my respects to their elders past and present. Uh, for international guests who have come here today, this is a very important uh, tradition at events like this in Australia, recognising 
uh, the, the cultural heritage of the land in which you meet. The other very important tradition in uh, Australian conferences is introducing American guests to real coffee. Um, <laughs> All up and down Ligon Street, you can get real coffee. It, it's not what you believe it to be in the US, um, so take advantage. Um, it, it's my pleasure to be here this morning to welcome you to Connections 2017, the first ever Melbourne conference for disorders of the corpus collapsum, or DCC, organised by OzDoc. Um, thank you very much for inviting me. I, I must say that it, it's, a, it's an irony that um, the least qualified person in the room has been asked to open this event. Um, I am not a medical expert, I am not an a, a academic, I am not a, a family member or a, a person living uh, with this disorder. In fact, uh, most, like most members of the community, I should say though, it's not an unusual experience to be the least qualified person in a room as a politician, but <laughs> roll with me. Um, like most members of the community, I hadn't heard about uh, DCC before it affected someone that I knew. Um, in fact, the first time that I heard about DCC and the challenges um, that it posed uh, to people living in this condition was when um, a constituent's family um, contacted me about it. Um, again, here's Marie here, Abby. I can see Abby. Marie stepped out. Um, and through those engagements, I, I started to learn a, an enormous amount about the condition, um, about the impact that it has on people of all ages, on their families and their loved ones. Um, impacts that extend far further than mere medical symptoms. Um, I learnt that DCC is a rare and little known, little understood condition outside this community. Um, and that this lack of awareness and understanding about the condition, um, and in the health and education system as well, also contributes to an often difficult journey for parents and individuals as they seek to understand what is happening. I learnt about the impacts of DCC, that they range from uh, very mild to severe, and that the pathways for diagnosis and appropriate health and assistance, assistance are far from straightforward and that at the very mild end, a parent can be left wondering if what they are seeing in their child is with a normal range of behaviours, um, but with a niggling worry that, that something is wrong. Um, and I learnt that at the more severe end of the spectrum, DCC can be often misdiagnosed as something else altogether. So holding a conference um, like this provides an important platform for education and information sharing amongst health professionals, parents, families, teachers and support groups. And it also helps to build an important community across these groups um, to work in partnership to provide the best health and education services possible for those impacted by DCC. I'm a dad and I've got two young kids. I can't pretend to know what it's like to experience DCC as a parent, but I do know firsthand that terror of not knowing what your child is going through, of seeing um, a, a child struggling with a challenge that you don't understand and that other people um, may not understand as well, um, and not knowing what the right thing to do to help. So I know that parents are often the most powerful advocates for their children, and that when they work together with health professionals and academics, that is when we can get the best outcomes uh, for people living with this condition. OSDOC was founded by such parents um, who have had the drive and passion to forge the best possible life paths for their children and many others living with DCC, and I support the aims of this organisation. It's worth repeating these themes here advocating, developing effective partnerships with key service providers. And as a politician, I can't, I underemphasize how important this is. If you don't speak out, no one else will. Advocacy is crucial in this area. Uniting, connecting people affected by disorders of corpus collapsum is crucial. I often find that the groups that are least understood by the broader community can bond together the best um, to be powerful advocates uh, within their community and supporting, raising awareness through education, information, research and resources. So I applaud the initiative OSDOC to run this conference over the coming days. It brings together leading experts and professionals to share information about this rare condition and provides an ex excellent opportunity for learning. It's also an opportunity to meet with others who are in some way on this same shared path, to provide share stories of, uh, to share stories and to provide support. And I'm pleased um, that a smaller local gathering of families living with this condition was recently able to be held in my electorate in Altona in Melbourne's West. But of course, this weekend's proceedings are much grander, bringing together around 200 delegates, family professionals, kids, adults, all with access to some of the world's best and brightest in the field, educators, scientists and clinicians. And events like this can't happen without an enormous amount of hard work behind the scenes. It's a constant irony to me in my job that I see that the things that we value the most in our day-to-day -day lives 
the things that we value the most in our community and our families are generally the things that are done by people who are doing them without financial reward, doing them for love, not for money. Um, we, we value these things, so it's important um, that uh, we recognise them and thank people for this work. Um, this event is the result of months and months of preparation by the OSDOP committee. And given the enormous value that their work will offer to everyone here today, I'd like to take this time to publicly thank them for their tireless advocacy and passion on this issue. So thank you to Christina Coburn, Marie Maxfield, uh, Maya Palacios, uh, Nico, Nikki Harrison, Linda Franklin, Abby Kinneborough, uh, Michael Shanahan, Tanya Smith, uh, John Jonker, uh, Anna Uther and Melissa Bowden. Thank you for inviting me to open this conference. Thank you to the committee for all of uh, your work to make this conference a reality. Thank you for inviting me to open this conference. I hope that it provides you with the support, the connections and the advocacy that you need to forge a better path for your families uh, dealing with this condition. Thank you. Thank you. My next task is to introduce four keynote speakers. Professor Warren Brown, a round of applause. <laughs> Dr. Lynn Paul. <laughs> Professor Linda Richards. And Professor Elliot Chur. So I'm going to attempt to read this nine point font, if I may. <laughs> and I don't think it's going to work. So, <laughs> after all my preparation, um, so what I would ask uh, if you could introduce yourselves, please. <laughs> and that, that's about putting uh, responsibility back on foot. So, uh, first of all, Professor Warren, could you please introduce yourself? Uh, I'm Warren Brown. I'm from uh, Pasadena, California. I'm a professor at the Graduate School of Psychology at Fuller Seminary. I am director of the Travis Research Institute, and I've been studying the genesis of the corpus callosum for about 25 years with my students. Perfect. Good morning. So I'm Linda Richards. I'm from Brisbane. Uh, and I'm the Deputy Director of uh, Research, I'm Scientist, and I'm the Deputy Director of the Research Institute in, in Brisbane called the Queensland Brain Institute at UQ. And um, I love Ausdoc. <laughs> uh, I've been working on trying to understand how the corpus callosum forms and how disorders of the corpus callosum come about for the last, it'll be 20 years this year. 1st of September this year actually is when I opened my lab and that was my uh, career goal to my understanding of this course. And uh, I have a great team of um, students and postdocs who are coming behind me uh, that hopefully will continue that work into the future as well. Moving right along. See, I'm not even needed. <laughs> Uh, good morning. My, my name is Elliot Shear. I'm a child neurologist, so that means that I take care of uh, children with neurologic uh, conditions. And I focus on children who have uh, developmental challenges, so kids uh, like many of those who have ACC. And actually, one of my first patients um, had ACC, and that's how I sort of got in, into this. And that was over 20 years ago now. Um, and um, like uh, Dr. Richards, I, I run a laboratory, but I have a slightly different focus, which is to use um, genetic tools um, as a way to um, discover the causes and, and using that as a way to think about novel therapies for the children who are having these challenges. Good morning, I'm Lynn Paul. I am also from Pasadena, California. And I have been studying a genesis of the corpus callosum for about two years less than Warren because I came in as a graduate student working with him at a point when he was looking for a graduate student to pick up this project. So we've been working together for 20 plus years on trying to understand the cognitive and social implications of these conditions. Um, what behaviorally happens that is consistent across individuals with corpus callosum malformations. I'm currently at Caltech, 
uh, doing research there, but I'm also a licensed clinical psychologist, so I have a small private practice as well. So we have to mute him. So thank you very much. So we've got until 11.30 here this morning. Uh, so what we're going to do is invite each of our uh, keynote speakers to come up and wrap on their topic for 15 minutes. And then um, we'll uh, make a short break and then come back and they'll each uh, answer five questions. But uh, I certainly would encourage you uh, for audience participation. If you have any questions, please don't hesitate. And uh, Professor Warren, Sam, would you like to come up first? So Marie has given us some sort of icebreaker kind of questions to talk about and to answer. And so uh, in that light, I will try to follow the basic outline that Marie has given us. She's given us some questions, one of which is to tell a little bit more about yourself. Uh, my, I am a research neuropsychologist. Lynn will introduce herself as a clinical neuropsychologist, so I don't see persons with uh, uh, brain disorder uh, clinically, but we have a lot of folk with a genesis of the corpus callosum through our lab. Uh, so I study and have studied for about 25 years individuals with a genesis of the corpus callosum in a very large and extensive research project that's been going on for a long time now. Uh, I got, uh, there are two sort of sources of my interest in a genesis of the corpus callosum. One is a person I met at the University of St. Andrews many years ago named Malcolm G's. Malcolm had started studying a few cases of a genesis of the corpus callosum when he was a professor at Adelaide and uh, then moved soon after that to St. Andrews and had worked there for a number of years and I met him and got to collaborating uh, and, uh, with him and talking about a genesis of the corpus callosum. At that period of time, what was of interest in this topic was how information got from one side of the brain to the other side of the brain without the corpus callosum there, and what kind of information could get ba back and forth and what kind of information could not. It was called interhemispheric transfer. So I was doing studies of interhemispheric transfer, and there were a couple of families close by that uh, had never met anybody other than their child with a genesis of the corpus callosum, knew no other families. These kind of organizations did not exist. And so I thought, well, I know what I'll do. I'll get them together for lunch. So I got the two parents together for lunch, and it was just an amazing time for them. Your son does that? That's, they both were uh, teenage boys. My son does that. that. Maybe that has to do with a genesis of the corpus callosum. And it was just a wonderful uh, time for them, much as uh, the time you're going to be uh, able to spend in the next two, here, two days here at OSDOC. But what it did for me was to suddenly go, you know what? What I'm studying is not of the least bit interest to these families. What they're interested in is what is the cognitive and mental capacities of my child? How does a genesis of the corpus callosum play into that? What is the nature of their social disabilities? And, and is that related to a genesis corpus callosum, or does that have some other resource? And so there was just all sorts of questions that these families had that I realized I wasn't the least bit interested in in my lab at the time. So I made a big shift in what I was studying in my lab. This was about the time that uh, Dr. Paul came into the lab, and so we began uh, at that time to, be, to uh, study a genesis of the corpus callosum very differently, and immediately became apparent that there just wasn't anything out there in the literature uh, to answer the kind of questions that I was hearing from parents at that lunch meeting. So that has a lot to do with uh, my sort of passion and interest <coughs> in this area. Uh, Marie has three questions here that are, for me, somewhat linked, or at least the more I thought of them, the more linked they became. One question was, what a piece of advice would you give to families? Another question was, what sort of advice would you give to other 
healthcare professionals. And the third was, uh, who would you most like to have dinner with? Of all the people in the world, alive or dead, who would you like to have dinner with? And the more I thought about that, I, the people I would most like to have dinner with are some of the people I read, because I just find them really interesting. And one of the best books I have ever read was a book called uh, Dependent Rational Animals by a philosopher named Alistair McIntyre. And in those, in that book, McIntyre says some things that I would like, I think are what I would like to say to families and to other healthcare professionals. So I'll actually read two statements from Alistair McIntyre, sort of my contribution here. Uh, uh, the reason I like McIntyre's work, and that book particularly, is uh, for a philosopher, he talks uh, better and more thoroughly and more reasonably about disability than anybody I have read in philosophy. And so he says in his book, um, there is a scale of disability on which we all find ourselves. So it's easy in this meeting to have people with a disorder of corpus callosum and people without a disorder of corpus callosum and act as if the world is sort of partitioned that way. McIntyre says, no, there's a scale of disability on which we all find ourselves. Disability is a matter of more or less, both respect to degree of disability and in respect to the time periods in which we are disabled. So we all live on a scale of disability on which in various times and various periods of our lives we move back and forth on that scale. So that's one thing that, that I think we all need to kind of keep in mind as we think about this. And then if I can uh, roll forward here in my PowerPoint slides, where's my, okay. Hang on a minute. All right, here we go. This is a longer quote. So, uh, McIntyre also talks about the uh, assumption that a disability, he says blindness, deafness, deformed or injured limbs, we would say a disorder of the corpus callosum, and the like exclude the sufferer from more than a very, very limited set of possibilities that a disorder of the corpus callosum limits in some inevitable way the range of possibilities. But he says that this has often been treated as if it were a fact of nature. What is obscured, obscured thereby is the extent to which the obstacles presented by these afflictions, like a, a disorder of the corpus callosum, can be overcome or circumvented depends not only on the resources of the disabled, the person with a disorder of a corpus callosum, but also on what others contribute. Others whose failures may be failures of imagination with respect to future possibilities. What disability amounts to, that is, depends not just on the disabled individual, but on groups of which that individual is a member. And so OSDOC is a group of which individuals with disorders of a corpus callosum can be a member. And what the failure would be would be a failure of us to uh, imagine creatively what might be possible for individuals with a disorder of a corpus callosum. So I think that's what we're here to do the next two days is to imagine what might be possible. Thank you, Professor. Now, I know you started on one of your questions. Did you answer any of the five questions, or did you...? I can take questions, sure. No, no, I was going to say, oh, what I was going to do is, uh, we'll hear from each of our speakers, um, and then we'll open it up uh, at that stage for questions. So I hope you're uh, writing them down furiously. Okay. Uh, can I invite to uh, the speaker, or up to the stage, please, Professor Linda, please, come up. Good morning, everybody. Um, let me see if this works. If it doesn't, we don't need it, really. There it is. Um, 
There we are. It's there. Technology worked. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, good morning, everybody. It, it is really just such a wonderful thing to see this second Australian conference of Australia's of, um, OSDOC. <laughs> uh, the, to see this group come about and to have you all come together and support one another is so important. And um, when uh, p new people come, and sometimes they contact me first, sometimes they contact OSDOC first, it's just so fantastic to be able to say that there's this really wonderful group of people that you can contact who may be able to help you, just in terms of sharing experiences and um, rallying around trying to get more um, in an advocacy role uh, trying to get more understanding about these disorders in our community. And so um, I guess just to go back to the questions a little bit, um, to s for you to understand also where I originally, why did I end up working on the corpus callosum? What, why was that what drove my passion? So I am a scientist and um, I was I did my PhD actually here in Melbourne at the Walter and Eliza Hall Institute, which is famous for immunology, but there was a lab there doing neuroscience, and they were trying to apply uh, some of the discoveries in immunology to understanding how the nervous system develops. So that's kind of where I started from, and I got the bug. I, I thought, this is an amazing area of research to work in, to try and understand how the brain is formed during development, just as a scientific question. And, um, and then when I finished my PhD, I chose uh, what I thought was the best lab in the world to go to, which was one in California at the Salk Institute. The guy's name was Dennis O'Leary. And he was looking at the cerebral cortex, which is this, um, can you see my pointer there? This whole part of the outside of the brain here is the cerebral cortex. It's huge. And it's bigger in, in humans and dolphins than any other species. This is the area of the brain that evolved um, at, to be uh, able to process complex information. And I thought, if we can understand some of the, the nuts and bolts about how that's put together, then fundamentally, as humans, we want to understand ourselves. It's a bit like um, astronomy and wanting to understand what's out there in the universe. We really want to understand the brain. And uh, in doing so, then we'll have a way to also tackle um, neurological diseases, mental illnesses, disabilities, intellectual disabilities, and a whole range, everything that's controlled by the brain. So I do come from that slightly different perspective of wanting to understand fundamental knowledge originally. And um, I wanted to study the corpus callosum because it's Huge. It's a fantastic large tract in the brain that does allow us to ask questions about how does one part of the brain connect to another part of the brain, firstly, and then how, how does that underpin how the brain is able to function? So in doing that, it, it, it's actually a very what we call multidisciplinary sort of approach, which means that I need to collaborate with all of my colleagues here to look at not only the very detailed genetic, cellular, structural changes that are going on, but then once, once we have connections, how does that um, influence how, how the person can function? So I hope that's not too confusing, but that's sort of where we're coming from Try, with um, the International Research Consortium, which I'll talk a bit more about tomorrow. It's trying to bring those scientists together that have e expertise in, in different parts. So that's sort of where I came from. And this, um, for anybody who hasn't seen MRIs of the corpus callosum, that, that's the corpus callosum right there. And you can see, it is, this is an hu adult human brain looking down from above, and it is just a really, really big connection. And one re quite interesting thing is, if you don't have a corpus callosum, you know, how, how are you able to function? And is there a whole range of um, 
abilities that you have that we want, we want to understand how that's possible. And uh, so they're, they're the sort of scientific questions around studying the corpus callosum. Now, another question was, who would I most like to have dinner with? Or? Yes. Yes. Um, <clears throat> I was at a, a, a lunch um, <coughs> fundraising event last week with Quentin Bryce. She was the former uh, Governor General of Australia. And she said that she once had lunch with Nelson Mandela. And I thought, wow, <laughs> that would be amazing. So either Martin Luther King or Nelson Mandela, I think, would be incredible because one of the things we want to do in our, in our country is bring everybody together in a way that the, those individuals were able to in their countries. So I guess that's what I'd say about that. OK. Did I miss any advice you would give to professionals or and parents? Right. So, um, so I've given you the science side. Thank you, Lynn. <laughs> but then, of course, um, when I met Lynn Paul, uh, we, she told me all about the NODCC. And I started to meet a few families in Australia, and there was an idea that maybe Ausdoc would form. And I can say that that has changed, it has made me grow as an individual, but also change the research focus of my group to really encompass um, advocacy for this for these disorders and um, every chance I get I talk to people about these disorders to try and get um, and and this means not just um, politicians and uh, other uh, members of the public but in particular neurologists pediatricians radiologists any uh, of the professional uh, people that I come in contact with, because there's still a long way to go in terms of um, having people understand the types of um, challenges that people face and uh, you know, how we can perhaps develop best practice or at least provide that kind of support. So it's also changed you know, my research. Beautiful. Any other questions? Uh, did I forget anything? Yeah. <laughs> no, you're right. All right, we'll have questions at the end anyway. Thank you very much. Thank you. And I'd like to invite, being gender neutral, to invite uh, Professor Elliot Shearer up next. Are you gender neutral? No. <laughs> <laughs> but I've learned about it from my high school children. <laughs> Good morning, everyone, again. Um, so I think what I'm going to try to do is um, stick to the script as best I can. Um, I have a tendency to go off, so I'm just going to look at the notes that I made. Um, so um, I, I may have said this a little bit in the introduction. Um, um, I'm a child neurologist, and so that means that I've trained in pediatrics um, and in neurology, and so I have a particular um, desire as well as expertise in, in caring for kids with neurologic conditions. Um, and in, in addition to, you know, um, coming up with medicines or, or uh, giving medicines to help treat children or helping families arrive at a diagnosis and helping explain what that diagnosis might mean, one of the most important things that um, I can do as a child neurologist is to help scaffold services for um, a child who has particular developmental challenges. So making sure that all the therapies are set up that if they need and can get access to uh, professionals like uh, Dr. Lynn Paul to evaluate them cognitively, um, that that can happen. So I'm, I'm sometimes um, like the sideline coach. You know, and, and the parent is the quarterback really running the show, and I'm sort of shouting, you know, from the side, turn left, turn right. And, and occasionally they give me a look like, stop giving me advice. <laughs> but, um, you know, uh, I try to provide that additional help. Um, and, and when I'm not seeing patients, I, I run a research group. Um, and when I first started, um, doing research, I, it, I had sort of a similar journey to what Linda did, but I sort of changed sooner. I was um, 
doing research that was very, very basic, trying to understand how nerve cells communicate with each other. They're called synapses. Um, and I was studying one of, the, one of the important details of how that communication worked. And while it was fascinating work, it seemed too distant to me uh, from my patients. And I knew that the way I was going to be most passionate about my science was to have that direct line from who I saw in clinic every day um, and what I could then go back into the laboratory and try to do. And so that's what led me to refocus my work. It's not as if synapses aren't important in ACC there fundamentally important, but, but I think of it as, you know, um, a, a group of conditions that need explaining and uh, work from that direction as opposed from the bottom up. Um, and, you know, the, the more gray hair I get, um, the more I'm, I'm, you know, I have that sort of uh, itch about me to, to try to really change things by uh, coming up with new therapies, and, and Dr. Uh, Brown and I had some fruitful conversations um, on this visit here, um, and I'm hoping that we'll be able to um, push that envelope as fast as possible. Um, the caveat, of course, is that, you know, the more you know, the, the better you can design a, an intervention, um, but there's still maybe evidence um, you know, that it's worth trying and not waiting until we know every last bit of information. Um, let's see, what a piece of advice that I would give to families, um, I would say to everyone, everyone in the room, that your child has most likely, almost certainly, untapped potential. Um, and be patient about helping them achieve that potential. Um, I've, I've definitely seen children coming into my clinic who haven't, you know, had real struggles to make developmental milestones. And then, um, you know, as is often the case when things are going well, people don't come to see me. So then I won't see the patient for a few years, um, and then mom and dad will bring the, the child back basically to brag. Um, <laughs> and those are the most fun, uh, you know, appointments I could ever possibly have. Um, so if I was going to give one piece of advice to, to professionals, what would I say? Um, you know, uh, some people, when they, when they hear about ACC, will say things like, oh gosh, you know, that's, that's such a severe impairment, there's really nothing we can do. Or you have people on the other end who say, you don't really need your corpus callosum, you're just fine. And so, you know, like, like all things in life, the truth often lies in the gray middle. Um, and so that's what I'm trying to convey to the professionals. Um, there are lots of child neurologists in, in the States and in Canada, obviously in Australia as well, but there's a, you know, a society that I belong to that's comprised of about a thousand child neurologists. Um, and many of them um, know about what's going on, but many of them still have a, a lot to learn. Um, and so one of the things that you know, I did is I wrote a chapter for a textbook that all child neurologists read. And that's sort of my opportunity to both teach them about the science surrounding ACC, but also get on my soapbox a little bit and um, you know, talk about their need to learn about, about the condition. And I think that you know, other people, uh, other child neurologists are, are getting more and more interested in this and you know, seeing the enthusiasm um, in your group and seeing the enthusiasm um, in the wonderful meeting that the, that the doctors and scientists from Melbourne organized the last couple days, I think is proof that we're moving in the right direction. And then finally, if I were going to have dinner, um, so I, I um, confess a, a desire to be entertained, and so I would pick Ben Franklin, um, because um, he sort of strikes me as the epitome of a man of letters, a man of science, um, a person. Um, and um, he, was, he was ever a restless mind trying to answer questions. 
um, and also a very much a human being. Um, and so, uh, you know, I, I uh, would hope to be able to even just begin to, to learn from somebody who's uh, that talented. Um, have I answered all the questions? You have. Okay. All right. Thanks very much, and I look forward to meeting more of you. Thank you, Elliot. I just uh, would like to suggest, have you seen a game of AFL football? Yes. yes. Because the gridiron metaphor didn't work. No. <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking, is that the football? Yeah. That's right. I was going to think of a full forward uh, Ruck Rover uh, metaphor, but um, thank you very much, Elliot. And uh, last, but by no means least, Dr. Lynn Paul. I agree with Linda. This is, it's a joy to see you all here and to see how Ostock has grown. And I remember too very well talking with Linda and her saying, there's a group of families that wants to get together and I study mice. I don't know what to do. <laughs> And I knew right then she'd be great because she cared. And that is critical. Um, so I got into this field working with Dr. Brown. And to be honest, it was because I needed a dissertation project and he needed a student. And so I acted like I knew what he was talking about and said, sure, I'm, I'm interested. I can do that. <laughs> um, and I don't, I don't mean to make it sound so cavalier. There were things about the topic, which was trying to understand the elements of the brain and the neural systems involved in things like empathy and social skills and understanding other people. And that was a, a topic that kind of hit home for me because as a kid, for very different reasons than most of the people with ACC, I was, I was a little bit of a social outsider in this little small town in the Midwest. And I remember very clearly thinking at about age 10, I don't get it. They all understand each other in a way that I don't understand. <coughs> and part of that was having siblings who were in graduate school and living at home, and I didn't really know how to be 10. But that feeling of, I don't get it. Everybody else has something going on and a way of connecting with each other that I don't understand. And the frustration of that really has, I think, given me empathy for the people with DCC that I've worked with through the years and their frustration. Um, and I had great advice at that time, which was, hang in there. There will be people in the future that you will connect with. And Last night, as I went out with a group of the scientists that have been together, I thought, oh yeah, Mrs. Conley was right. <laughs> These are my people. <laughs> <laughs> and it's not just because they're all scientists, and most, last night most of us were women scientists, but because they're scientists who care about what they're doing and care about the people involved deeply and passionately. And that, I think, for me was my fundamental career goal, to do something that is scientifically challenging, that is a puzzle that I can work on forever, <laughs> and puzzles that build upon puzzles, and that means something to real people who I know and care about. So for me, a big point in life, a uh, big transition was, as I started working with Warren, and started to get to know the families. As he said, he had these two teenage boys. And then we wanted to find more people with the condition. And this is the early 90s. And we found the ACC Network, which is a family organization in the US. And they had a, a manual, or not a manual, a directory of all the families that they knew and little descriptions of them. And so I went through and marked all the families that looked, sounded like their kid might fit what we were studying little higher functioning, the right age range. Called them on the phone, and I found five families in the Midwest of the United States where I, my family lives. And my mother and I drove house to house from Illinois to Ohio to Kentucky to Indiana, and I tested these kids. 
And that for me was also priceless because it was family support and interest in what I was doing. And having that is so precious. So these family support organizations, I mean, my parents have been to a couple of these NODCC conferences, my mother's spoken. To see generations come to these meetings when you bring your parents and to see siblings who come and ask questions and want to understand, that's the, the community that Warren was talking about. And so I, I see it not just as addressing the problems problems, the condition, and trying to understand it, but trying to help the community function better. And that is, I couldn't ask for a richer career than that. Um, and, and better colleagues. I was just sitting here thinking, actually, with these three, these are probably three of my best friends. And to be able to work with people, sorry, <laughs> who, who care about families is a great thing. And if anything, I think we all wish we could provide more for you and we had better answers and more time and more resources, um, but we'll do our best. And I trust that all of you know what it's like to be in a position where you think, I just have to do my best, I have to show up. And some days that's the best you can do, right? <laughs> just show up. So my, my advice, um, to professionals and to families is probably one of my other big pivotal moments as a person. Um, it goes back to that. And I was in high school, and I was a, I was a little bit attention deficit and a little bit ahead of things. And so I would get the, the assignment before class and then sit and do it during class. So I didn't have to listen. <laughs> Confessions. Um, and, and yeah, that was part of the reason people didn't really like me, but that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> but I had a teacher who cared enough to come out in the hall after class and in tears say to me, you are selling yourself short. I know you can get the A, I know you can do the problems, but you don't listen and you don't learn that there are multiple ways to solve the problem. And you don't listen to the questions other people ask in class and how they think. And you miss out on layers of learning because all you're trying to do is get that answer. And that I think is, is pivotal. It's pivotal to becoming a scientist. It's pivotal to being a parent of a child who struggles. Is being really willing to listen and try to see things from other points of view, to listen to the professionals, to listen to your kids, and for us as professionals, to listen to you. Because it was very humbling to start out in this career, and especially as a young scientist, I want to be all professional and be the expert and realize, I just need to shut up. <laughs> These parents know a lot. And you can teach your doctors. And it's important at the same time that you show interest and respect in, toward what they have to offer so that they are open to listening to you. It's all about connection, communication. Um, my other bit of advice and my last kind of comment here is that life doesn't take you where you thought you were going to go, right? Um, when I was trying to figure out where to go to grad school, I had great advice, and I have passed this on to many students and, and friends since then. The person said to me, as I was saying, well, if I go to this university, I'm going to study this, and I'm going to become this kind of person. If I go to this university, I'm going to Finally, she said, you don't make a decision based on who you think you will become through that process. You make a decision based on who you are now and what you know now. And then you fully engage the process and let it change you <coughs> and discover who you become as you go through it. And so you all came into this process of parenting not expecting this journey. 
And I know each of us have had moments in our life where something happened and it was not what we thought we were doing. And yet, it's led us to do the science that brings us here to help you. And you as parents are gonna help so many more families by joining together and bringing information forward. And so taking those moments that weren't where you wanted to go and figuring out how do I live through this? Not just survive it, but live through it. How do I make the best of it? Not just for my kid. Some days that's, survival is the only goal. But bravo to all of you for coming, for being a part of Austoc and trying to make your life experience mean so much more to the community. Um, I don't do well with that whole who do I have dinner with thing. No, don't worry about it. So, <laughs> and I've talked too long anyway. I'm a psychologist, I like to listen to people, so whoever. <laughs> Questions, I'm sure they're all percolating away there. So what I'm gonna do is just hand the mic over to the panel members. Who's got a question? We just like to stand up and uh, sorry I'm cross eyed so it's okay. Just stand up and <laughs> that's my disorder. And a uh, question to the group. To the group, yeah. Um, I'm the mother of a daughter with complete anxiety disorder. Originally, when I went to have her diagnosed, the only reason she was doing poorly was because I was a bad parent. So I'm really pleased we've moved on from there. <laughs> um, I have two questions actually. Um, my background is pediatric physio, and I have worked for ever with disability from you know not to five year olds, with speechy OT special educators. Um, my question is, if you, uh, I believe greatly in brain plasticity, has anyone ever done a long-term study on an MRI of a little brain and then intervention using, um, well, um, a very specific intervention and seeing a change in the brain, has there been uh, increase in connectivity, incre change in the way the brain is developing with specific, and I, I really mean specific <coughs> input, and, and practiced input, so that the, the child actually achieves the skill we're setting out to achieve. Second question. So, so I'm just going to say, we just hold that so that we can actually, okay. so first of all, we'd like to take on a bit of a description of neural plasticity, um, to make that first question, we'll come back to you. Thank you, volunteers. <laughs> Yeah. And the short, the short answer is no. Um, there are there are a few studies that have um, gone on um, over a period of weeks to months uh, where people have looked at um, functional connectivity, um, and some of that is has been encouraging, but some of it tells us that we're still just at the beginning. So there's one particular study that was done by folks in. Um, in uh, Pittsburgh who, who do neuropsychology and they had a reading paradigm <coughs> that they then taught um, and that paradigm led to improvements in reading ability um, but the regions of the brain that were shown to be enhanced in their connectivity were regions that no one had ever linked to reading before. <laughs> so, um, so one answer is well that just means that we don't understand plasticity right and we're still just beginning to learn it. Um, and the other one is we still need to do more of this, but, um, yeah, please. <laughs> um, my, I, I was thinking of the same studies. My comment typically to parents is, we as scientists are trying to figure out the, the systems and the connectivity and the deep details of how that's working. Um, Parents will ask us to specifically increase interhemispheric transfer, and I always am a bit leery of those and want to know what studies they have done that shows that this is actually doing that. 
and how that's going to particularly benefit your child. Personally, I'm, I would encourage you to focus on helping the child learn the next skill they need to learn, learn it well, and trust the brain to be organizing and figuring out a way to do it because your kids' brains are not wired typically. It's going to have to figure out how to do it. So to go in and say, oh, if we have them you know, practice crossing their hands over this line all day, somehow that's going to make them be better socially, <coughs> that's a pretty big jump. So if someone's telling you that they, they can do that, let us know. Let us know. <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted to make a comment about MRI. Um, so it's really important to understand that the um, techniques of MRI, whether they be um, functional, which means activation in different areas, or structural, like the, some of the images I was showing, those techniques are in development. It's hard to sort of understand that actually the science behind those techniques is, is the ongoing. And so um, making a definitive answer with that technique is still not you know, considered that we understand what's going on. So I just wanted to, to say that. The other thing is, if we, I mean, one of the reasons to come together is so that we can um, share uh, information and um, perhaps eventually to run some kinds of um, intervention trials across a bigger group because you need at least a number of people um, with the same condition in order to run a clinical trial. And I think everybody here would say that unless a, an intervention has really been tested in a double-blind clinical trial, it's very hard for us to say whether or not that would be an effective treatment. Do you agree? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'll just add that every experience we have that uh, causes us to learn is a brain event. It changes the brain. So in some sense, the question is not do we have a treatment that changes the brain, everything like that. The question is, do we have a treatment that is effective for the problems with respect and having a brain correlate of it doesn't necessarily validate the treatment more than the outcome for the child. Or the outcome. Yes. Yeah. 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 Right. 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 The one thing that I would add <laughs> to this, and I completely agree with Warren's comment, obviously you have to show improvement and the other thing is that it has to be sustainable, mm -hmm. um, you know, not just for a, a few weeks. Mm -hmm. um, the reason to have these other measures is not to sort of unlock the mysteries of the brain, although that's a benefit potentially, but rather clinical trials, you know, having a group of individuals do anything, whether it's take a medicine or undergo a cognitive intervention. Or or you know physiotherapy, whatever it is, people are diverse, and the data that comes out from that is noisy. Yeah. Um, and so the reason for having these measures, at least now, as far as I can see, is to potentially decrease that noise. So that if there is something that changes robustly in the brain, regardless of how we're measuring it, um, and it shows up again and again, that might be a way to help us understand, you know, not only what's going on, but also who's going to benefit the most from <coughs> any given intervention. So we would call it a biomarker, um, and I would view it as that. Thank you. Thank you. And Patrick, your question. Patrick, well, oh, uh, <laughs> um, yeah, thank you for that. Um, I was told when she was end of primary school that she should go to a special school, mm -hmm. and. A red flag to a ball. She is now has done a university course and is a registered nurse. So, you know, and and it is just you've got to be tenacious. You've got to say no. We're, we're going. It, it's repetition, repetition, repetition across the board. So she's done pretty well. <laughs> um, the other question is um, autism. Is autism a discrete diagnosis or is autism part of? <laughs> yeah, well, the reason I ask is I went to a, a neuropsychiatrist and he gave her the, the whole deal and no, she wasn't autistic and 
there were still questions, so off to Aspect, which is the Autistic Association. Yes, she is autistic. As a discrete though. I've got someone grabbing for the microphone already. Um. So I'm just wondering, is it discrete or is it part of agencies? <laughs> this is a really important distinction. A genesis of the corpus callosum, dysgenesis of the corpus callosum, is a physical anatomic diagnosis. You diagnose it on a brain scan. Here. Some of your kids also have chromosomal abnormalities, other things that you can document by chemical tests, medical tests. Autism, OCD, ADHD, attention deficit disorder, are all behavioral diagnoses. They're descriptions of behaviors that tend to cluster together. Like depression. Like, well, depression. Um, that they describe, we use them as clinicians because it gives us a shorthand and they t since they tend to cluster together, those symptoms come together and they tend to follow a predictive pattern, they're useful as a tool. But they are not a diagnosis in the sense that you're talking about. And it's entirely probable, and I say probable, I would say really confidently, that there are lots of people who really meet the criteria for autism for very different reasons. So one thing I want to say is if someone tells you your child can't get an autism diagnosis because they have ACC, they're talking about two different things. You want a behavioral diagnosis that describes the behavior. And it doesn't matter where that came from for those diagnoses. Does that help? And we do know that about a third of, from our studies in Elliot, it's about a third of adults and <coughs> children with ACC will meet criteria for an autism diagnosis. Even more have some of those symptoms, even if they don't fully have the diagnosis <coughs> on this you know, checklist of symptoms. Uh, so, it, it, when you get different diagnoses, it's a tool. Linda, are you uh, chomping the bit for the microphone? Oh, Would anyone else like to respond? No, I, think that, I think that's I think very well covered. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for those two questions. Um, up the back. Yeah, hi. I'm just leveraging off a couple of points that um, the guys made on that question. Um, with the advent of the NDIS in Australia, we really need um, some sort of guidance document for um, evidence-based best practice because um, as we found going to um, NDIS meeting to explain your particular issues for your child to get support, you've got to in invent all the um, supports that you need. They, they don't actually know what you need whereas, so for autism, there's a national guideline for from the states and there's also a, a guidance document in Australia now so they understand what best practice support is and what evidence-based practice is. But we've got to explain that to a person who has no medical background. They don't know what to give you as far as early intervention support is. So that's what we need. Um, and for all the parents that come after us as well. So your question is in regards to the National Disability Insurance Scheme, um, are you looking for a best practice yeah, off diagnostic the, tool? Off the panel from you know the psychologists, the clinicians, the neurologists, physios, OTs, speeches, educational people, behavioural people, all that needs to be put together so we can get a, a package from the NDIS. Can I just ask a quick question? All right, so are you asking about best practices, evidence for treatment or for diagnostic evaluation? Uh, for treatment. For treatment. And okay. non-medical treatment has to be therapy-based. Therapy-based. <laughs> therapy-based. Okay, thanks. Just a, just a bit of a question there. Yeah. Um, I'm sure everyone else will have comments, but to start with, um, so one of the th things that I'm, I'm pleased about is that over the past decade or 20 years, by starting to make some some noise about this diagnosis, 
malformations of the corpus callosum now has a specific diagnostic code in the international classification, the ICD-10, which is a, an important step. Now, that's not used typically for establishing therapeutic interventions, but it does Explain what ICD-10 is. <laughs> so, so th these are just um, tracking codes for diagnoses. Um, some some people use them for billing purposes. But in the um, US, or is it? No, it's an international. It's it's international. The I stands for International Codes what? for Diagnosis. Yeah, I forget exactly. But it's an international. Framework. There used to be an ICD-9, and now there's an ICD-10, um, and there is a specific um, designation for disorders of the corpus callosum. Um, I forget what it. I remember the nine one, but it's not the ten. Q40 something. Yeah, um, but I mean, I think that, <coughs> that doesn't really buy you anything other than a diagnosis. Um, but I, my comment would be that that is it at least a preliminary step to establishing that this that this um, group of disorders is is more than just you know a blob of brain malformations. But what we need is the, so, the, um, the evidence for support. So it's not like potentially talked about at that really early stage when kids are like zero out of three. So can I just sorry, Could you stand up, please, and speak up? Hi, my daughter um, is three and a half, and um, I've just been liaising with the NDIS in devising her plan. Um, and having ACC, I really feel that every situation is going to be unique in itself. Mm -hmm. And as long as she's been diagnosed with ACC, then I have grounds to be able to um, identify therapies that I feel, as a parent, will be effective for her. Um, and I think that should be sufficient in terms of devising a plan. Is there a question of the panel? Mm -hmm. um, so can we go back to that can, can we just can we mm -hmm. The short answer is the field of physiotherapy, the field of occupational therapy, the field of speech. cognitive speech. intervention, speech and language, um, are bereft of evidence-based medicine. So that's one issue. Number two is it's actually not trivial to do a placebo-controlled trial, right? With a pill, it's very easy. You take a sugar pill, um, and you can hide, the, hide it and do it. But with any intervention, there's an intervention that's happening. And you can't, obviously, have the control be no intervention, um, because then that's a bias in the way you design the trial. So it's, it's challenging to do it in the way that would meet what we would call true evidence-based medicine. Um, that said, there are, um, in, in the field of autism, and I think <coughs> for purposes of ACC, I would include them in this, not that everyone with ACC meets diagnostic criteria. There's something called the Denver Model of Behavioral Intervention, um, and that has in multiple trials where there's a different form of intervention where it's just standard, um, uh, that that actually shows a, a sustainable improvement. Um, interestingly, going back to our question about what improves and, and what markers you see, the thing that most robustly improves is, is IQ, um, and not necessarily um, social <coughs> competence, which is you know, one of the main reasons why the, why the intervention is, is started in the first place. Um, there is evidence for swim-based therapy, for example, um, showing improvements in, in motor skills. Um, a lot of children do horseback riding therapy, you know, what we call hippotherapy, but there's not any evidence for that. Um, and so, you know, I, I know that you guys are having problems here. We have the same problems in, in the U.S. where um, evidence-based proof lags behind commonly accepted, um, you know, practices and things. And, I, you know, I don't know how to bridge that except to stand up to the representatives and say, fund the research that allow us to answer the question. Can I add one thing? So, just 
just quickly two comments of, about this. There hasn't ever been a longitudinal study starting from birth on about behavior of these conditions. And that's something we launched a couple of years ago. It's online, yeah. so you can, and I know many of you are already participating, um, but it allows us to start tracking what are the, what is expected, what appears to be common, and, and at least have a description of those early years. And we're applied for funding in the US so we can expand that study. Our International Research Consortium will be continuing to do that. So any of you who have kids under age five, come see me and we'll enroll you. Um, the other thing is the research consortium that we keep referencing, which is represented well here, um, is planning, and we, we hear your cry, and one of our to-do items is to figure out at least a statement of best practices that are known now. And I'm not gonna promise you that that's gonna happen in the next few months, <laughs> by any means, uh, because of our schedules and everything else, but I just wanna reassure you that we do hear that, and as, as researchers, we wanna do what we can to help you with that. I, I just, uh, so all of those are kind of like complicated issues. I guess sometimes people even just need the basic of, um, they, get, they get the diagnosis from all different people. Sometimes it's a clinical genesis, sometimes it's a GP. Uh, and I'm, I'm talking about the adults as well. Sometimes it's, a, you know, the emergency room. So um, what can you do at that point? I guess which types of professionals might be useful even just probably knowing that, maybe? I don't know, is that, yeah. Yeah. would that be useful? Mm -hmm. So usually the starting point is either a developmental pediatrician, and I presume you call But I'm them. talking about adults as well, mm -hmm. i.e. when they find out when they're adults. Right, right. Well, depending on how old they are as adults, if they're young adults, most child neurologists will, and behavioral pediatricians will see young adults up till approximately age 25. Not here. Not here? 18. Mm -hmm. okay. Or when they finish high school. <laughs> um, then, um, you know, I think that that's a challenge for if they get a diagnosis as an adult. Um, how many of your children had a diagnosis after the age of 18? And 18. So that's definitely the minority. Um, it sounds like that's a minority in this room because the adults are adults. And they're very clear here. But anyway, yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean the, good point. <laughs> there are lots of there are lots of holes in our ability to help people, and that's yeah. that's obviously one of them. Can I just ask quick the IRC? Um, is anyone on there, I was trying to read the names and things, does anyone represent the, um, like, obstetric fetal free yeah. medicine? Yeah. 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 Was like, that as there well. was just a recent symposium here in Melbourne, like, yes. a couple of weeks ago, yeah. and so I started looking up these people, and I, I haven't heard of these people before, so <coughs> these, you know, my experience was diagnosed um, prenatally, and the information was really lacking. Like yeah. I went into the yeah. appointments yeah. with yeah. Dr. Scher's research <laughs> yeah. and said, can you call this man for me? And they said, no. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> is, yeah. is that information getting passed well, to you? Yeah. 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 So in, in, in our consortium, we do have um, a clinical geneticist, George McKelvey, who um, does a lot of fetal counseling um, in Melbourne. Uh, but I hear what you're saying. So um, what Peter's talking about was um, a conference on fetal imaging and obstetrics that was here last week, I think. Mm -hmm. um, so a person that George works with was at that conference, and then I spoke to somebody from Monash who leads the fetal imaging group there just yesterday. Uh, so I'm gonna go and talk to that group um, in August. Simone. And, um, Simone. Yes. Yeah. So um, Simone Mandelstam is a neuroradiologist that is um, also part of the IRC5. She, you may not 
see her because she's a radiologist, so she's reading all your scans. In fact, everybody who's been in my study, she's read your scan. Um, and um, she works at the Austin and also at, um, uh, at the Children's. So, there, yes. And, well, and then internationally, Tanya. No, I, I was just going to say that one of the main topics that we are talking about a lot, I mean, a lot of our day on Thursday was spent talking about how to improve prenatal diagnostics, how to work to have better predictions based on prenatal diagnostics, using everything from genetics and imaging and the genetic counselors all the way to behavioral um, interventions and behavioral assessment. So that question is definitely high on our priority list. Thank you. Yeah. Sorry. Thank you. Before we go to the next question, I'll just want the committee members who wants to uh, provide an additional answer to that last question. Sorry, back to the question about best practices, that some Ausdocs we're, we're trying to start, and there's a session today, session four in the panorama room, working on best practices guides and getting that going. So, that was specifically your question. That's it's what we're working on, and you're welcome to attend. That's one of the other selected yes. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yes. I just want to say something about the best practices. And I know there is a big stigma about one practice that we did and it worked incredibly well. And Dr. Elliott mentioned the method. That's a part of a practice called ABA, Applied Behavioral Analysis. And that is an evidence-based practice. And I don't know why it's really frustrating and sad that that doesn't get mentioned at all. Not even in autism and maze here in Australia, not even here, because we've done it. and. Uh, We've been through four years of intensive therapy and we made an enormous progress. So we started with our daughter was two, she's six and a half now and she goes to the mainstream school. And it is evidence-based, so there are 60 years behind that therapy and there is no mention of that therapy anywhere. And I would encourage people to go and look at the therapy because it does help. It reaches to the full potential of your child and it might be at different stages and ages, but in our case, it's just an incredible progress. And the name of the uh, therapy is? We, we finished this year after four years, and that's the intensity that our kids need, regardless of the diagnosis. Unfortunately, stigma about ABA is people see a little YouTube video clip from God knows when, and they say, oh, I don't want my child to go, to go through that, but it's moved from 60 years to now, and it's a play-based therapy. And when you see your prog progress in your child, then you start to see that it is a good therapy. And yes, the cost is a big thing, but some people would do anything to help their child, and we are by no means, so by no means, you know, when we saw the cost of the therapy, I knew that that's the therapy that will help because it's a skills-based therapy. It's nothing to do, when people hear the behavioral, they think, oh, it's going to brainwash my child and this and that. No, it's a skills-based therapy. They're teaching your child all the skills they need and it's done step by step. But because it's so intensive, it goes like every single day, it rewires the brain of your child. So we started from thinking whether we should put our child in a special education now that she's in, in the mainstream and not just hanging in the mainstream, she's doing exceptionally well. Yeah. I, I, mean, I, just, yeah. Yeah. I just want to comment Good. further on that. I, I mean, I don't know how much it costs here in Australia. Um, I do know that in California um, that clinicians like myself can order um, ABA therapy for their, for their patients. And it usually is many hours a week, um, anywhere from you know, eight or 10, all the way up to 20 um, uh, hours a week. And so it's very, very intensive. It has to be done by a trained ABA therapist. So that's a limitation for us, not that the state won't support it, but literally there's a shortage of therapists who are qualified to administer this. Some, some of the qualification courses are Yes, sure. yeah, I know some of them are, are, some of them are less, less robust than others for sure. Okay, so I've got the next question behind you. I was just going to add, um, I know in South Australia, um, it is considered best practice for the NDIS. 
And it will be funded it's now by the standard. standard. I understand that. Have you got a question then? Uh, no, no, no yeah. question. Just a comment about I know in South Australia it's considered standard practice, um, best practice for more autism under the NDIS, so they can get fully funded. The only trouble around 30, is, I think, a year, kind of as you said, is the qualification, and that is true, and that's what gives that therapy a bad name, because unfortunately, especially now with NDIS, I think the problem that we will face is that a lot of psychologists will say, I'm doing ABA to get more funding from NDIS, so what people really should look into is getting a qualified practitioner, and to be a qualified ABA practitioner, you need a lot of hours and a lot of degrees behind that. So you need a BCBA practitioner, which is rare here in Australia. We were fortunate enough to have a Canadian lady four years ago when no one even knew about ABA to come in and to bring that practice here. And I suppose in America it's way ahead of you know practices in Australia. Right. Uh, like, like, like the CBT model though, like there are so many different um, ways that people are actually providing this therapy. So although we Although there's suggestions that there's an evidence base behind it, there's evidence base behind discrete trial and you know particular elements of it that aren't necessarily like when you're saying they moved away from what was previously there. Some of that previous evidence base is around um, a particular delivery of ABA. So then when we're looking at more play-based or pivotal response training and things like that, there's you know, there isn't necessarily, it doesn't necessarily fall under that initial evidence base as well. Like, there's just so many different... Um, unfortunately... Uh, can I just, I'm sorry, if I can just interrupt. I'll just have the wind-up signal. According to um, <laughs> our program, we have to go through to 11 o'clock, so we've got less than uh, half an hour, so I just want to try and keep the questions for the panel members so we can maximise their expertise. You have a question? Yeah, what does the panel um, see as current best practice interventions and therapies? <laughs> um, I need a volunteer from the table. Linda? No. I can't, I'm not qualified to answer. Really? We're taking volunteers. The dilemma is none of us are really qualified because, as Elliot was saying, there aren't evidence-based studies on, on kids with ACC. So, and that is an important thing to know because... As I, I will say again, when someone comes to you and says, I have done this and, and I have evidence that this works in ACC, don't buy that. And they will want a ton of money for some of those things. I mean, at least be skeptical and know that you're, it isn't necessarily evidence-based for ACC. That's the dilemma. Okay. Right. Okay. So I just want to add one thing to that. So first of all, I agree completely. The second one is, let's say we go back and talk about ABA therapy. You know, why does it work, I think is unclear. Does it work for every kind of etiology of autism or every etiology of ACC? I don't think we know that either. So I think, you know, evidence-based is a, is a funny term, particularly for children who are all very diverse in terms of their skills and challenges. Can I have one? So, Going back to the issue of listening and, and respecting you all as parents, you are the first line of determining if you think an intervention is being helpful. And it's important for you to be critical thinkers about is this really helping us in quality of life and asking tough questions, not just to be tough with your therapist, but to to really, you have to decide if, if it's worth that effort. And, and sometimes you don't know, and you make the best decision you can based on what you know at the time. And that was why I said that. And give yourself some grace for the fact that we don't have good guides, and you're forging the new path. Thank you, Lynn. Questions? Um, just here. Um, have you got any advice on how to get uh, MRIs from doctors. I'm finding it extremely challenging. I've got an 18-month-old baby who has been diagnosed at birth, um, and I'm finding that doctors just will, um, yeah, getting MRIs is near impossible to get, to get, um, to get any diagnosis for learning, 
Um, as well as for me, I'd like my son to be diagnosed because I have an inkling that he's got ACC as well. It's, so what we, uh, we have a wonderful panel here, but we don't have a, I'm not a clinician, I'm not a doctor. Um, and uh, it would be good if we had some of the Australian doctors who are on IRC5 that are in the other sessions. It's really them that would probably, because I don't know the Medicare, how they, you know, um, how you're able to get an MRI through Medicare. Um, and uh, currently, as you know, I mean, the research, the research scans are really expensive and um, unfortunately, despite our best efforts as a group to try and get a grant from the government, for the Australian government this year, including these guys, uh, we didn't get it funded. So again, um, unless I have funding, I can't, I can't, I just can't do the is, research scans. Is there like people that we can all write to over the next like month or so and just like bombard them with like fund these people? So tomorrow I will be talking about um, a, an effort in Australia, not just for um, my own research, but um, an Australian effort for um, to try and get more funding for neuroscience in Australia that we're going to take to the federal government next year. And then I really want your help. Um, and we're, we're going to bombard politicians left, right, centre, green, maybe even family first. <laughs> so, so to answer your question about, about MRIs, um, so uh, there was a group of doctors that I um, participated with, um, and we wrote practice parameters about how to evaluate a child with developmental delay. And in that practice parameter, it states clearly that a brain MRI is one of the first tools that should be used to come up with a diagnosis. So if your child has developmental delay, take that paper to the doctor and say this is the, you know, it's, it's not the Australian uh, society, but it's the US and Canadian societies jointly um, supporting that. And it's on the NODCC website? I'm sorry? What was the paper for? Yeah, I, I will get the paper from oh, Elliot right. and I'll give it to the Ausdoc team. So can, Thank I, you, can yes. I just add that the session tomorrow morning will have Australian clinicians and you can ask the question of them and they'll probably be in a better position to answer. Thank you. Thank you for the information. Um, you. Hi there. Um, just a quick question. Um, I was just, I, my son is seven years of age. Um, he's PACC and he's a great little kid and, you know, every... Every few months is, you know, major obstacles, and in every day there's a tiny little, little amazing obstacles that he's um, overcome and achieved, and he's going great. Um, so I was, I, I often just wonder, for what his corpus callosum lacks, does the brain kind of step up and try to find other ways to help him achieve the things that, that's structure that's absent. Ooh, pick me, pick me. <laughs> uh, so we talked a little bit about plasticity before. Yeah, I don't understand the term, sorry. Right, so plasticity means um, how, a couple, it means different things actually. So in the, um, in the general sense when you hear plastic, brain plasticity in the media, they're talking about the, the tiny connections between one neuron and another neuron. We have maybe 10,000 of those per neuron, and they're changing all the time. As you learn something, actually, your brain, these tiny, and I mean the microscopic, okay, these tiny little changes are occurring, and that somehow is correlated with encoding the information in the neuron. So, that's often what we talk about in terms of plasticity. But in this context, the, there are also, so they're the, the kind of parts of the neuron that receive the information. Then you have the, the part that is one process that connects that neuron to its target other neuron over here. So, and then the corpus callosum is just the collection of a whole bunch of those. And uh, so one of, this is a really fascinating area of research actually, is that during brain development, it appears that the brain has the capacity to, if there's some issue, 
like it can't cross over the midline, that perhaps it will take another route. Yeah. And that we really want to understand those processes because maybe then we can manipulate them. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, and particularly in the partial ACC, that's quite a really a varied group of um, disorders, quite complex. And um, with the new imaging techniques, we're understanding that the position of where that partial ACC is doesn't necessarily correlate with which parts of the brain are connected through there. But um, just going back to the research point of view, for us that's so interesting because actually um, we can try and look at the, um, the, the, the deficits, if you like, or the, co the cognitive uh, outcome based on the brain wiring and see if there is any kind of correlation there. Uh, just in terms of understanding how the brain works. Yes. So. You're talking about prenatal brain wiring. Yes, sorry. Yeah. So during early development. Right, yeah. So, so, so the follow-up on that, and I love how excited Libby gets about this. Because <laughs> it is fascinating. Um, the first thing she was saying about the synapse connections, the neuron to neuron, like, here, take the message I'm passing on, yeah. is what Warren was talking about, about every time we're doing something, our brain is making connections and associations and learning and changing because of it. But if, I think you guys are back on this, if, if there was not a corpus callosum at birth, there will not become one, and there will not be some new exciting path that jumps over the middle and gets to the other side. It's like, one of the analogies I, I use is if you were born without a hand, you're not gonna grow a hand. But you can learn to do all sorts of things that a hand would do to be able to function. And that's what I was getting at earlier. When you're teaching, teaching your child to do what they need to do, yes, their brain is learning, and it's making new connections. But it's not the kind of connections that Linda was just talking about. It's not making new giant pathways that go from side to side or front to back. Does that clarify? Yeah, that? That so it's like the other parts of the brain are stepping up. Other parts of the brain are stepping up, working together, really yeah. figuring out a way to make this work as good as it can yeah. with what it has. Yeah. But I, I often hear parents say, oh, well, the brain can rewire itself. Yeah. It's not, yeah. that's a little misleading. It's not yeah. that it's rewiring in the sense of it's putting new cables. Yeah. Yeah. No. But that's like so fundamental. We don't understand that process mm. very well at all. Mm. It's an <coughs> Thank you, Linda. <laughs> um, next question, up the back there. G'day, thanks for coming. Uh, looking across the room, there's a bit of a cross-section of the community, obviously. And like all disorders, this one is random. My question is about causation. Have there been any studies done to show, I don't know, correlations between specific races or lifestyle choices made by the parents or genetics or whatever? Any correlations at all? Because as a parent, you're always looking for an answer going, why, how, what's similar between me and that guy? Have any studies been done? Or would we to answer that question? Okay. Right. So, I mean, I think that's an outstanding question. Because um, his career is based on it. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, the, the, sh the short answer is we know about some. Um, and, I mean, maybe a show of hands if you have, if your child or your loved one has a genetic diagnosis, can you just raise Not your hand? Yet. That's a half a hand. So, so, yeah, a few, not, not as many as there should be. Um, you know, Linda was talking about different tools um, that are available, um, and they've been improving quite a bit. Um, and I think that we can probably get an answer from roughly a third to a half of individuals with ACC, but that still leaves, uh, you know, 50% or more that are, that are undiagnosed. And part of the meeting that we just finished having um, included, um, you know, professors from, from Australia here, uh, uh, folks in, um, in, um, in France and in Germany, um, who are all 
I'm sorry? Rio. Rio. And Rio, thank you, Rio. although she's not doing Gen X, but um, who, are, who are looking um, very, very hard um, at coming up with, with diagnoses. Um, and the point behind that is not just to be able to say, well, this is what's causing it, but to really begin to understand the specifics that you know Linda Richards is referring to with regards to um, how that affects brain function and brain plasticity, and you know how you might um, better understand whether they're going to respond to particular uh, behavioral interventions. So, do you want? Um, so, Linda's asking, do you want? Do you want to no, know about what a what the genetic causes are specifically? Yes. Heritability, not, not just heritability and de novo mutation. No, not specifically. I mean, I don't want to know what the genetic causes are because um, I anticipate that would take too long. <laughs> All I was interested in is there any has there been any var any variables or any correlations whatsoever. If any cross studies have been done, I mean, you've got a perfect sample group here to see, you know, I don't know, if any cross studies have been done with any external factors, perhaps like race, uh, right, right, ethnicity, okay. whether people made lifestyle choices to, to drink alcohol or smoke or whatever, if any studies like that have been done to see if there's correlations. So, so um, I, we did an epidemiological study that we published about 10 years ago where we looked at individuals in the state of California who had ACC, and we looked at risk factors. Um, maternal age um, actually seemed to be the one that was the, the most significant when we looked at it. It's hard, it was hard in the study to um, tease out the difference between dad's age and mom's age, so it may also be the case that the dad's age also contributed to it. Um, we. Yeah, we're talking about over 40 and over 50. So, and, and that's in comparison, the control group was individuals who were 25 to 30. So, you know, you don't see really any difference until you get to 40 or really 45. And that's sort of analogous to other um, children who have things like Down syndrome, right? It, it goes up a tiny bit um, in the 30s, but it doesn't really significantly change until the mom is 40 or, old, or older. Um, we do know that, um, and, and this is not meant to, you know, I imply anything to anyone in the room, we do know that exposure to alcohol in utero um, is a risk factor for developing ACC, and that's really probably the only environmental factor that, that we know about. Um, most of the genetics that we've been finding are um, genetics where there's a new mutation in the child that's not in mom or dad. Um, Sometimes it's inherited, um, and I would just say that we, in genetics you find the things that you can find, and so these, what we call de novo, these new mutations, those are the easiest to find with the tools that we have, and so that's why we're seeing that. But there are probably lots of other genetic causes that we're trying to disentangle. Thank you, Elliot. Okay, we've got uh, about 12 minutes left. So, uh, questions, questions, questions. Can we, you know, announce research and have some of the research that uh, causes, practices, the outcome? Do we have a research on group that follows, let's say, babies until they are 17 and then, and then have outcome? Okay, so you're not in there, so I'll hand the to you. Well, that's uh, the, the longitudinal study, following babies as they grow. That is one of the things that is started. So if you are interested, you can go to the Caltech Emotion website and, or just put Caltech and AGCC or Corpus Systems and you will babies. But that's babies and it will continue on. Um, we each have studies, I mean that's what we've been doing is trying to understand and figure this out. The challenge is and that research takes, it takes time it takes bringing people in from around the country, around the world. It takes gathering samples from medical sites. And all of that takes people and to support us so that we have the, so we're paid to do it, so we have that time. Which is the way we get paid is by getting grants. 
typically grants from the government, whether it's Australia or the US. And in the United States right now, when you put in a grant, your likelihood of getting funded is less than 15%. And it can take a year or more to gather the data that you need to even apply, let alone a month or two of your time to write it, or three months to write it. So you're taking a third of the year plus your students' time to write a grant that you only have 15% chance of getting. And, and then you won't have money to pay yourself or anybody else. <laughs> so I, I don't mean to be totally discouraging. I just want you to understand that that's what we're up against to try to do anything. But we're trying. We're trying. And, and I want to give Linda huge, huge praise because she has put this big center grant in two years in a row that has put, it's taken months of her time to write it and submit it, knowing that the likelihood that she would get it the first or second time was really low. And it's really hard to make yourself do it the third and fourth year in a row and hope that one of these times it gets through. So keep being nice to her. <laughs> <laughs> one of the things you have to do is pay attention to where we are historically. So when we started working on this 20 years ago, there was not much awareness of it. There was not, um, there was thought to be very rare, not much more rare than, than we realize it is now. And there was not any good description of the <coughs> consequences of it such that one could begin to think about what an intervention might be. So we're right, right now at the point where there's good awareness, there's good sort of networks, and there's the possibility now of thinking about what might be intervention. So, you know, you're, I understand your, your uh, impatience with um, not having therapies, but it just is an historical point at which we are in the understanding of disorders of purpose closing. So I would just add one thing, which is, you know, um, Lynn and um, Warren and I traveled from the States to be here, not only to meet with you guys, but to participate in the IRC-5. And the purpose of the IRC-5 is not only for us to learn from each other, but also to synergistically engage in research that you know, would give us a better shot at that challenging 15% because we're in a large group and we have greater resources and greater opportunities to leverage that. Thank you, Elliot. And I'd just like to say that this is all about connections and one of the things that I'm hoping to see still out of this is a type one action plan about where to, how we can make connections, how we can support the research to make headway. So that's going to be one of the outcomes of this conference. So stay tuned. We've got um, seven minutes left. At the front here. I just wanted to ask a question. Please stand up. Oh, I just wanted to ask a question about deconfirmation. So I know my daughter's um, scans have identified you as deconfirmation. Hi, everyone. I'm Lisa. <laughs> my daughter's Abby, and she's five. She has... Hey, let's um, have a microphone. Oh, yeah. okay. <laughs> I'll, I'll just take her now. Yeah, yeah. My daughter, Amy, and she's five. My name's Lisa. Amy has a uh, hypoplastic um, corpse callosum, and she's quite complex in that she also has and I'm the identified metabolic disorder, um, sensory processing issues, and autism. So she's quite a complex sort of character. Um, but one of her scans identified that she has demyelination, and I just wondered if you could explain um, what that is. Um, and yeah. Can you do my job and just hand up the mic? Sure, please. <laughs> I'll ask you. <laughs> well, I can, I can explain the demyelination. <laughs> So do you, can you answer a little bit more about what sure. metabolic condition they think she has? Sure. <laughs> now you've done it, guys. I know. Yes. So <laughs> it's an unidentified yeah, metabolic disorder, um, and it's manifesting as rage crown kinase. So that's why they're thinking she has a muscle oh. issue, and she also has raised lactate peaks on her MRS. 
So I'm really confused about all the things that's happening for this child. It's very complicated and it's difficult to tease out what is a manifestation of her corpus callosum issue, what is a muscle issue, what is autism for her. She's sensory seeking, she's sensory defensive, she's got so much stuff happening for her. So I just wondered what demodulation has to do with any of that. Right. The reason why I'm asking is that um, you know, a lot of times, as you said, it can be a lot more of a complex picture, and it's not necessarily the case that the corpus callosum is the, you know, the cause of all of the concerns, but rather it might be a sign of other things that are happening in the brain. And so, de so myelination is the insulation that gets wrapped around nerve cells. So when, when you're born, you have very little myelin already in the brain, but over the first three years of life, a lot of myelin forms and wraps around the nerve cells and enhances the, the speed that, that nerve cells can communicate with each other over long distances. It's and like then, insulation. Like, yeah. you know, like a and I can now brain. see how that manifests in her and that she's become more um, sensory defensive or sensory seeking over time, possibly because of that nerve conduction. Right, so the, the demyelination, that implies that when they take a picture with the MRI, it looks like there's a, a loss of myelin. Um, it, there can also be um, something called dysmyelination, where the myelin doesn't look normal, but it's not so clear that the myelin's actually being lost. Um, it if it's actually being lost, that's usually said when there are multiple scans and they can see changes over yeah, time. Yeah, three. Okay. Um, so that's, I mean, just something to just generally say that that's not something that's common in, in individuals with colossal uh, disorders. And we've got uh, time for uh, sorry. We've got time for about two questions. Um, going once, going twice. Over right there, yes. Please get up. Is there any point? I'm a member of the Australian Twin Red Registry. I'm <coughs> asking them: Have there ever been any twins born with one with Agnes? There are, and there's a new family in Sydney as well um, with identical twins. One has um, ACC, so they're both they're only just born and. Um, I will be emailing them soon to pass on their research. They're different. They're identical yeah. twins, but one has ACC. And one doesn't. One doesn't. Do you, well, you can talk about why. Uh, so, of course, any um, we have a, a database for um, uh, disorders of the corpus callosum, and um, if uh, you know, if anybody wants to enrol in that, there uh, actually um, Sinead Air will be here who runs my database and it's an Australia-wide database. But um, I guess twins, yeah, twins do offer re research-wise a very um, special case um, where we can look at two people, if, especially if they're identical twins, and um, see how the gene, you know, to identify the gene maybe and um, see how that's playing out in, in two people with the same background genome. Would you see lots of like de novo mutations? I'm assuming that's obviously after they've become twins, there's been a mutation there. Would you see lots anyway? Like is it still going to be hard genetically to find what is like? Right, so we haven't, I mean that's a great question. So mm -hmm. the question is if you have an identical twin, at least at baseline, you assume that the, the two twins have the exact same genetic material that they, they got from mom and dad because if they're identical, that means that one egg formed with mom and dad's genetic contribution and then after that split into two individuals. And so as you're saying correctly, um, if there's a de novo mutation, did it maybe occur after that initial split? And sometimes that split can occur later, not at the single cell stage, but at you know, at four or eight cells. So, you know, it can, it can happen sort of in that process. Um, we've never really done a twin comparison in colossal agenesis, so I don't, so you know, I don't know what to say exactly um, whether we would find stuff, because it is also possible that that de novo mutation that you're referring to occurred even later, maybe even as late as when the earliest parts of the, when the embryo is differentiating into, it, it differentiates into three different layers and it's possible that it occurred at that point. 
um, and we may not see it simply by looking in the blood. Um, you might have to look like in skin tissue or, or other places to see where that change occurred. Can I ask them what we Sorry. The Last question. <laughs> oh, yes. Oh, that one. That's Linda. It's a Linda question. <laughs> Last so question. So we, um, we actually do understand cellularly, like the, pro the developmental process um, underlying complete HRSs of the corpus callosum now. So if anybody would like me to explain that later, I'm very <laughs> happy to go through that. And the, um, the callosal axons begin to cross around week 12, 13, 14 of gestation. And you have a pretty fully formed corpus callosum by around 20 to 25 weeks. So that's, that's the time we go. But having said that, after birth is the myelination and there's still you know, some expansion. And so we don't have a good answer on them, you know, exactly um, whether the new axons are out or not. But you can certainly see it by ultrasound by 20 weeks. Yes, definitely by 20 weeks. Maybe a little bit. The earliest time points, but maybe 18 weeks earlier. You're a specialist looking for me. Yeah, I think if you're really. But around 20 weeks, you can actually identify. It's one of the measures, should be one of the measures, when you have your ultrasound. Yeah. Thank you, Linda. Thank you. Unfortunately, that's all we have time for. We've got a whole two days to tap into these resources. Uh, so if you never have a chance to get the question answered, I'm sure we'll be out the next two days. But I will just remind you that if you haven't got your lanyard in a bag, please go to the front and pick one up. Can I just ask you before you stand up just to give a huge round of applause? Yeah.